So the human is quite often capable and will run him down and kill him or shoot him in the back or whatever. The problem with that is to be a technological tool, tool using intelligence is to carry the seeds of the species destruction as you go. Because as your tools develop more power, you use the tools in your intra-species conflict. You learn to kill people faster and easier. Um, Hitler was just the beginning, you see, in burning the Jews and all that. Uh, you get the ability to kill them off in mass. Or Herman Kahn once said something at a conference I attended that was remarkable. You know, he said it wasn't the fact that there was a mechanism that, if unleashed, would destroy all life on Earth. And that didn't bother him. It really didn't bother him very much. What bothered him was that he knew 200 such mechanisms. So, and that's kind of the point. They say we, to be a technological intelligent species, you are in a time game. Your species will self-destruct unless it learns to adapt. Now, what adapting means, you know, you get that from whatever philosophy you're in, but I think what it means is you've got to outgrow the material. You've got to get into where precursor engineering is and where you're handling the energy direct, right straight with your body functions and your mind functions and all. You be, you become almost like a godlike power. So cybernetics is an extension of tool building and tool use. But you see, it's a double-edged sword because the first use we're putting it to is in our conflict. So we're using it against our fellow human before we're using it for benefit. Yes, it could be used for benefit. It could be used for great benefit. But with our usual diplomatic aplomb, we're going to use it first to kill a lot of folks or hurt a lot of folks or inconvenience them and so forth. If you look at the collective human species, unconscious, that we're all part of, uh, that's interesting. Look at a, a human mind. The conscious is really a sort of periscope. We stick up out of the unconscious and try to pull it in when we go to sleep and so forth or when we have coma or when we get knocked out. But it's really like a periscope, and it's put up to deal with this world that we live in, this physical environment. And you've got to give precedence to it, because if you don't, uh, you know, if you, did, if you sit watching all this massive parallel processor called your unconscious, which is totally conscious, your conscious is a serially, serial processor, one thing at a time, one slide in that projector at a time. The collective unconscious is a massively parallel processor, or the, the unconscious, for example. It's controlling that group of cells right there in my knee. It's controlling this one right here in my skin at the same time, all this my, all that stuff, everything, all at once. If the serial processor, which can only take one slide and a projector at a time, tries to look at the unconscious mind, it sees jillions of slides, just sees black. Overwhelmed. So it can't recognize it. If the unconscious wants to communicate with it, it's got to take something that has all these multiple meanings, which is what we call a symbol. And it has multiple meanings. Symbolizes. It has to form it symbolically and present that to us in the form of dreams and stuff like that. And that generates Freudian dream analysis, Jungian dream analysis, and so forth. But the collective human unconscious is even worse. If we take a sane human being, it means he's pretty well integrated between his conscious and his unconscious. There's no huge overriding conflicts. If he starts to get some pretty bad conflicts, he becomes what we call neurotic. He's sick. And his behavior changes, erratic. If he becomes insane, he becomes very, very unbalanced. And, you know, we've got to put him in the institution or something. We can treat the guy that's neurotic, maybe. But the other guy, we've got to just stick him in the luna bin and hope that he ever gets treatable. What they really do is they uh, dope him up and keep him very quiet and so forth and treat him if they can, if he ever gets that way. But the difference between sanity and insanity is dissociation. Severe dissociation is the definition, legal definition of insanity. That means fragmented into pieces, is what dissociation means. Dissociation from being a unified functioning. Well, let's look at the collective human unconscious. That's what a human species is. That's the, the mind for the whole human species. Uh, what's his conscious mind? Yours, yours, mine, everybody's. 
Are they integrated? No, nope. totally dissociated. Well, you got a little over six billion people on earth and you got six billion dissociated, fragmented, conscious minds. That is about as insane as you can possibly get. I mean, a, a human being that had multiple personalities, if he was a tremendous case, might have 20, right? But six billion and something? Forget it, Charlie. So the collective unconscious, which has an extraordinary power, it can materialize its thoughts and dreams and own emotional responses, and does. But what it does is it has all this conflict from large groups of people going into it. So it has tremendous conflict at this because it's insane. Its consciousness is insane. It's severely dissociated. So what's the answer? The answer has got to be some kind of link between the consciousness. We try to do that with morality and laws and things like that. And we'll balance it all. We try to say uh, you have to have a standard of behavior where you know you can disagree with a person, but you don't take a knife and cut his throat. That's a no-no. I mean, it's against the law and it's immoral. We have to go from this kind of fragmented prescription. We have to go to something that that enforces that directly out of the collective unconscious. That if you make a boo-boo and you raise the knife to kill another human being, all the anger goes like the male deer. We have to have a hardwired response from the collective human unconscious we don't have anymore. If we don't get something like that, that will control our intra-species intra conflict, our weapons are so big now we are going to utterly destroy ourselves, probably the earth along with it. What would that be? I think that psychoenergetics is a tool that would let it be engineered if we had time to develop it and wouldn't use it to try to kill one another. So hardwire mod modification? Uh, well, modification of the collective human unconscious to where it now takes over the job of what we're trying to do with law and morality and all that. We're trying to leave people as free as possible for individual performance and enjoyment, but also to group constrain them so there are certain limits of behavior you do not do against the group. That's really what we're trying to do with all the laws and morality and all that stuff like that. Uh, that could be done perfectly by the collective human unconscious if we had the responses wired right in there. How? What's the mechanism of collective unconscious manipulation? Well, the collective unconscious, when it dreams because of these unresolved conflicts, just like humans do, you apply just standard dream analysis to the collective unconscious with all these conflicts between large groups of people. Um, you, can, you can psychoanalyze the phenomenology by what is causing the conflicts, what it's trying to express. Like when the Russians started plotting on how to take over Europe and all and all this stuff and wait till we disarm and get new breakthroughs and all this, this means a lot of threat against everybody's coming out of Russia. Immediately the collective unconscious starts materializing ghost rockets. Rocket had fired everybody's mind, right? It's a phallic symbol firing its tail, that's a, that's a symbol of dominance. Dominant, firing its tail, symbol, male phallic symbol, and extraordinary power and dominance is what it said. Hmm. You got a plot for power and dominance coming out of Russia. That's what you had going on with the ghost rockets. Hmm. So you can analyze every big wave and all this for the, what the uh, collective unconscious is trying to tell you. In the old days, kings used to know something about that in different terminology. And they hired what they called, today we would call soothsayers, but they called wise men. And these guys were chosen because of their ability to interpret the things that happened around the power structure, around the king. These odd, what today we would call paranormal phenomena. They learned how to read it and do what today we would call a dream analysis or a psychological analysis. Oftentimes they could tell him who was plotting against him, where they were coming from, from what direction, and about the time period they were coming. These kings weren't fools. He didn't pay these clowns good gold to get a bunch of junk from them. If they couldn't produce, he just simply cut their heads off. But he paid them good gold when they produced, and so he didn't have any to stay alive very long if they didn't produce. So that's why he paid them and why he kept them around them, because they were very useful to his survival. But they actually had people do that, that understood how to do that.
So what you're saying is we have we have to evolve and or, or we'll use our tools to kill ourselves. That's correct. We have to learn to master and overcome our use of the tools to kill each other. And the only way I see to do that, you know, we've tried religion, we've tried ballot, we've tried to bullet, you name it. We've tried this school, that school, this system, that system, whatever you want. And it's the old saying, you know, each one of those works for some of the people some of the time. So uh, we haven't found an answer yet in that way of approaching it. The only way I can see that give you an absolute approach, guaranteed, is hardwired in the collective unconscious. That means you've got to build it in there. You've got to turn around. If we are insane as a species, we're going to have to treat our own species. You see what I'm talking about? We've got to become our own psychiatrists and clinical psychologists for our own species. And we've got to put the changes down in there that have to be made. Now the question is, who's going to bail the cat? Who's going to get to, to do that? Thank you.